Okay, so the recording has started right now. Um, so as I just said, the speakers will be recorded. Um, please keep your camera turned off and the microphone turned off. Thanks. Okay, so again, this is a webinar on crowdfunding for the medical technology portfolio. And as I was saying, we thought that for early stage projects, sometimes it's hard to find co-investment. So we thought crowdfunding could be a good alternative. So we invited Daniel Oliver, who's the founder of um, the Capital Cell crowdfunding platform. Um, and please uh, go ahead, Daniel. Thank you so much for being the speaker today. And the floor is yours. Thanks again. You're muted, I think. I am muted. I, well, I'm not muted anymore. So thanks a lot. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I hope this is going to be uh, relevant to you. Um, what uh, for this session, since we have a bit less under an hour, I have adapted um, a session that I give very, very often in a number of courses for um, universities and for acceleration courses, et cetera, et cetera, uh, all revolving around uh, fundraising. Be before I start, just a very brief note about myself. I am the director of Capital Cell. I'm also, since last year, I'm also a partner in a VC, Nara Capital, and I am also the co-founder of the scientific spin-off. Um, so I think, and, and also obviously uh, as, uh, as Capital Cell, I am myself a business angel, although a really small one, and the founder of an IT company. So I think that I can look at startup investment from a number of different points. Um, I think I can speak with a little bit more authority now that I am in a VC and I see from the inside what the conditions are uh, there. And regarding my personal experience, uh, Capital Cell is a crowdfunding platform, but well, actually I can start with the presentation, I think, um, and tell you all of that with some slides. Right. So hopefully you're looking at uh, a slide with a very nice picture. Holy family, that. beautiful Barcelona there. Exactly. Well, beautiful. It's not beautiful, actually. Barcelona from the air is ugly, but we're proud of it. We like <laughs> it. Um, so I'm going to talk about equity crowdfunding as a financial product. The, the idea here is to tell you that equity crowdfunding really works very well. I don't think that um, in my experience, there is currently a better financial product for high tech companies in early stage. And I'm going to tell you why. Um, I think just a quick um, little bit about capital cell. This is slightly outdated uh, because, well, we do rounds constantly, but um, we are a company that has done 106 successful fundraisers for early stage biotech and medtech and digital health companies for a bit over 90 companies. We've had already five exits and there's almost 20 companies that have gone through Capital Health that have gone on to do a series A or even B with, uh, with VCs. Our portfolio is in relatively good health. We have an over 90 something percent portfolio survival. It's not 94. There's a couple of companies died since I wrote this, but it's probably 90. Um, and what is really odd is that if we average, because we did the figures uh, recently, if we average between 2019 and 2023, the overall amount of early stage deals in Spain and our investment, we represent yearly almost 10% of the total biotech investment in the country. Um, I think that means that yes, equity crowdfunding is a necessary financial product for early stage companies in biotech. Um, and uh, we're not exactly an alternative to VCs. We've actually co-invested with VCs in almost 40% of our rounds because our model, I'll explain a bit later, requires a lead investor. But um, all of that means that, well, it seems to be working. That figure here, 78 million, is now a bit over 90 million in rounds that average about 800,000 euro. It's gone down a little bit. Um, so 
It's working. We've only worked in Spain so far because the legislation until April 2023 did not allow us to operate outside of Spain. It does now, and we are internationalizing Capital Cell as we speak. We already have a team in France and in Italy, and we are raising a little round for ourselves to grow. You can invest in Capital Cell, by the way, more on that later. Um, but uh, please uh, get that message. It works. It works like a charm. It works really well. And I myself seem to be the person who has been involved in more um, early stage biotech and medtech rounds in Spain and probably in uh, in a good chunk of Europe, if only a number of operations. So I I beg of you that even if you have a whatever uh, opinion or vision on crowdfunding, uh, just uh, what I do seems to work and I've done it a lot. So yeah, believe me. So equity crowdfunding, first of all, is not, you know, uh, crowdfunding to fund your, uh, I don't know, book or movie or whatever. It's a regulated investment. Basically, equity crowdfunding platforms have a license from the regulators to allow for equity raises online. That's basically what it is. Online equity raises. And we are regulated by the CNMV, by the Spanish Stock Market Authority, under a European license. Uh, we do things in a particular way at Capital Cell. We use a network of experts to help us analyze projects. And that is really, really good for what we do. I think it's an essential part of the way uh, crowdfunding has to be done in this sector. Basically, we have, uh, it's actually uh, 3,200 experts from around the world that review every single project we have. We do this for two reasons. First, we want to make sure that someone who knows a little bit about whatever you're doing um, is looking at the project and giving us an, uh, an opinion, but also because the opinions of these experts are then published along with the investment proposals on the platform. And I can, as you can probably uh, imagine, investors do not trust Capital Cell. We're a financial company. Who cares? Investors do not trust entrepreneurs because entrepreneurs always seem to think they have great projects. But it, it's really good if you can put in the testimonial in the face of someone who's, I don't know, um, a KOL in dermatology or one of the top cardiologists in the world or whatever, if you can have his face on your investment proposal saying, if this hits the market, it's going to be the next big thing, then that's really good. So that's why we use the BioExpert network. It analyzes projects and we use it to convey trust to investors. Um, I'm going to go ahead and skip all of that about capital cell, capital cell, capital cell, blah, blah, blah. Right, so let's go. What is crowdfunding? Crowdfunding is nothing else than online fundraising. And you, you really should think of a crowdfunding uh, platform a little bit as an online portal to sell your house. It's pretty much the same. It's an online tool. It gives you more visibility. It makes you a lot easier to deal with the big number of people who are going to see it. Um, and it's a technological tool for you to do the work of actually, you know, having a nice house to sell with the right price, doing the conversations with the buyers, etc., etc. So it's not particularly different from that, but it's very effective. Uh, so let's start. Why not a VC? Because this is, uh, I think, something we get from pretty much every entrepreneur that comes to Capital Cell. Um, and it used to be a lot worse. People only came to talk to us when all the VCs had said no. Um, and that conveyed the, the feeling that uh, crowdfunding was a last resort for bad projects. But it's not true. So crowdfunding is correct, is going to work for companies that cannot get investment from a VC um, or that cannot get huge grants. Why? So first, I want to say something about how VCs work. Um, and what uh, 
the investment product is. So here's the product. The product is you, the entrepreneur and the company. You guys are the product. And as a product, you're really complex. So imagine um, that you're not an entrepreneur with a company looking for money. You are someone who's so rich that his main problem in life is what to do with his money. And that exists, apparently. What you have in front of you, an early stage biotech company, and excuse me if I use biotech you know, as an umbrella term, it's the same for medtech or for you know, life sciences startup. First, they are, uh, and actually for pretty much every high tech company. So first, it's a risky investment. Um, in that, don't let people tell you that biotech and medtech are more risky than I don't know, a marketplace for pet products. They're all super risky. A startup is risky, you know, uh, seven, eight or nine out of 10 fail. So they're all risky, but well, yeah, first. Second, there's a lot of them. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that Enrique would have the figure maybe in his head that there are literally thousands of new life sciences startups appearing in the European Union every year. And as a startup, and here is the first difference with your run of the mill IT or app um, uh, startup, they need a lot more money. The prototype of a marketplace or the prototype of an app or something like that requires 50, 100K. The prototype of a diagnostic panel to say something requires a couple of million, probably. So they need much bigger amount of time, uh, money. They also have a longer exit. Uh, time. So it's going to be probably a couple more years before your company either fails or is successful compared to other. And then, and I really don't want anyone to be offended. Life sciences startups tend to be in the hands of people with poor entrepreneurial skills, um, which uh, doesn't mean that scientific entrepreneurs are stupid. They mean that most of the times they are scientists. So they've had a lot of times uh, long experience. And as, as I say to investors, Someone who's capable of curing lung cancer has probably never been an entrepreneur before. He spent the last 20 years in a lab, most likely. So there's a lot of that going around. And finally, they are difficult to analyze. And this is one of the keys to everything. There's not that many people in the world who can analyze a life sciences company because the technology is key. There are things that are extremely particular to that regulatory, IP, the market is unique, etc. So, whereas pretty much any economist in the world can analyze uh, whether they're going to give a loan or not to a small business or to something like that, for a biotech startups, there's very few people who can do it. So, what is the limitation? Think of a VC as a big bag of money. And uh, a big bag of money means, uh, for example, 100 million. Let's think of... Uh, Asadi's partners here in Barcelona, 100 million euro. And if you know how they work, VCs have to invest all that money and get profits in eight or 10 years, a typical rating. So that's how a VC works. Um, VCs, the <laughs> poor idiots, also have to do fundraising. I have done the fundraising for Nada Capital, and it's pretty much what you do. The only difference is that instead of looking for people who are going to invest in a company. You're looking for people who want to put money into your bag. And you're looking for, as I said, 100 million. So typically you're talking to people who are going to invest one, two, three, five millions in your fund to make it as big as possible. And you have two constraints here. First, whatever money you raise, you're going to have to invest and de-invest in 10 years or eight. In the case of Nada Capital, for example, the period is eight. Second constraint, um, that, um, well, actually, let me speak about that first. That means that whatever money you have, you're going to have to invest it probably in the first four or five years. Because if you know that exits come in you know, four to seven years, if you invest in a company on year one, well, it has nine years to be successful and be sold. If you invest in a company on year nine, it, ha it has one year to be successful and be sold. So normally, knowing that companies need a development cycle of 
four, five, six, seven, eight years, you want to invest in the first four to five years. So you now have 100 million euros and you have to invest them in four years. And uh, well, I know that in Capital Cell, we approve roughly one in 10 operations and we're super generous. VCs generally, we're talking about one in 100. So let's do some quick math. If you're going to invest... Sorry, Daniel, there are some questions about crowdfunding specifically. Can I, can I shoot some of them to you? Oh, yeah. Uh, so, so crowdfunding, um, Michele Giuliano is asking whether crowdfunding um, offers some management help for the scientists who's transitioning into management because we know VCs do that all the time. Sometimes they bring in some management, some executives. How does crowdfunding work? Can you bring in some executives or this is not part of the usual crowdfunding workflow? No, crowdfunding is just money. You're putting your company in a platform. It's a bit like doing an IPO. You put it on the stock exchange, people get shares. That's what's happening, nothing more. It's money in exchange for shares. Understand. And the average amount that you can provide, I've seen the average is 800K typically in the past, right? But this is the typical amount that will be true in the future as well, around 1 million maybe maximum? Well, actually our, mag our average was above 1 million now since 2022. Um, since, as all of you know, there has been a financial apocalypse, uh, yet another one. They seem to come, you know, uh, more and more often. So since um, around May 22, it's gone down. Now our average investment is uh, probably closer to 700, something like that, which is very large for a crowdfunding platform. I have to say most of our competitors are in two, 300, 400K. Very good. And there's another question in the chat about a stock crowdfunding. Uh, is it legal in all the European Union? This is the question in the chat. Completely, yeah. Actually, we have a license. There's a new legislation that came into effect at the end of 2021. Then the regulators being the lazy uh, people that they are took 13 months to give out license. So companies are getting just now licenses. We got it in April 23, a license to operate in all of the European Union. Understood. Yeah, um, most of the audience, I think, will be scientists and entrepreneurs uh, fundraising or thinking how to fundraise in the future. So. Uh, yeah, any any details on the operational aspects of how crowdfunding works? Yeah. I think they will really appreciate that, the workflow, when should they apply, uh, should okay. they have a company already set up? I think the answer is yes, but maybe you can educate us a little bit. Can they apply before setting up the company? All those details, I think they will appreciate them very much. Let's do something. Let me uh, push through to some of that, and then, since there's probably a lot more, because I don't really have a presentation that can cover everything. That would take, you know, four hours. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to go on for another 15 minutes, finishing that and giving the notion of when and how to crowdfund. And then we can have a few minutes to open for questions that I would not expect um, and that are not answered Wonderful. here. Thank you. That's great. So just to finish here, um, the the math that I wanted to do is that um, if someone who has a fund of 100 million and who has to spend it in four years has to invest it in pieces of half a million or even 200,000, it's literally mathematically impossible. He would have to analyze like 8,000 projects per year and do, I don't know, what's 100 uh, divided by 100, 100 million divided by 100,000? They would have to invest in like 1,000 companies. Completely impossible. A fund is going to invest in 20, 30, 40 companies, no more. So a hundred million fund is not going to do a half a million investment. It doesn't matter. Uh, there's a lot of people who come to us and say, yeah, I've been talking to, you know, Sophie Nova or Kurma or Isius or whatever, and they really like the project. Well, if you're looking for half a million, they like the project. That's all, you know, they're not going to marry you because they can't. Mathematically, they can not. Second problem, um, well, if you get a VC for 200,000, for whatever reason, when they normally do 5 million tickets, you're going to get the same due diligence and governance, but six months of due diligence, someone in the board, 
and etc cetera, etc cetera. and in the early stages of your company you really don't want that you want to get married to a vc on your series a on your series b before that you should give yourself the freedom to pivot to make mistakes and you don't want to have a monthly reporting for a vc it's a lot of work you want to do monthly reporting for a vc when you can pay a cfo to do it so vcs are nice people uh, particularly nada capital my fund were really nice but they're not your partner at an early stage it is the wrong partner um so why crowds first because the the problem that you have and the reason that capital cell has been so successful in spain is that there's not that many alternatives um in biotech there's usually few funds and they're large because it is like uh i don't know how it is this year but it used to be the second uh, first second third sector in the world were more investment on VCs, but they're usually huge. So uh, the lack of an abundance of people who can analyze biotech startups makes it impossible to have small investors. Typically, there are no small funds. And the business angels, most of them have no idea what you're talking about. Business angels invest in things they know. And apparently, uh, and that's maybe a word of warning to you. Business angels tend to be people who have become rich through their professional activity. Very few of them are scientists. So it probably means that being a scientist, you're not going to become rich. But well, anyway, you knew that already. What can you do then? Crowd. The crowd approach means that it is, uh, I would say the philosophy here is, it is actually easier, and believe me, it is actually easier to find a thousand people to put in a thousand euro than finding one who's going to put in a million. It literally is easier, although it is a bit counterintuitive. Um, why? Because, um, long story short, the principal problem when someone invests is risk. And that applies to pretty much everything, including, you know, thinking, think of you loaning money to a friend you trust and loaning money to a friend you don't trust. Risk is the main a uh, driver behind any financial operation. Um, do people want to invest in a company that cures cancer and is going to make them a lot of money? Yes, they do. Why don't they invest? Because they mistrust it. They don't understand it. They don't know what it is about. Um, if it's a friend, maybe he's going to invest because he trusts you. And if it's not, I mean, you just don't understand it, right? Think, think of it. Would you invest in, you know, someone tells you that there's a super opportunity investing in offshore mining permits in Belize, for example. I mean, it might be a super project, but what do you know about it? So that's the situation of private investors when you approach them. But equity crowdfunding gives you a really, really powerful tool. It allows people to break down the risk in small pieces because, yes, I'm not going to invest a million in that. It's too much, even if I have it. But 10,000, 1,000, uh, 500, you know, whatever. Whatever is a really, really small piece of risk, people will do it because your proposal is interesting and because somehow you can manage to convince them to do it. So with the very few professional investors there are the business angels etc cetera, etc cetera, you're going to get can you help this, uh, tickets. Please, sorry. and with the non-specialist investor which is 99.9 percent .9 of the population equity care funding offers you the possibility of giving them a small piece do you want to invest in this well i'm not sure do you want to invest a tiny little bit you know why not the smaller the piece of investment, the smaller the risk. And there's another thing, which is on a crowd platform, you can see that a lot of other people are investing. So people who don't trust it are going to trust it. Uh, if you remember what I said before about the expert network at Capital Cell, we also use the testimonials from experts in the industry to give that thing, you know, a shared decision. There seems to be a lot of people who like it. It has to be all right. So crowd, psychologically, it works. What are we seeing? We have been very often accused of, you know, companies on capital sell have high valuations. Yes, you can get a better valuation 
on a crowdfunding platform than from a VC. Don't abuse it because you're going to have an next round, but you're going to have a better valuation. You're going to have governance conditions that are super light. No one is going to be on your board and no one is going to you know, ask for anything strange. And it's really quick. So companies who come to Capital Cell and they already have a little bit of a community or they already know how to talk to private investors. There are people who, between the moment they said, hello, how does Capital Cell work to money in the bank? It was three months for an average amount, as I said before, of 800,000. There is absolutely no equity product in the market that is so fast. So it's very good. All of that is just to say, if you want to find the money you need and you're extremely unfamiliar with crowdfunding, typically as a scientist, you have a lot of experience in asking for grants and you're very good at having one very technical conversation with someone who's an expert. Well, um, equity crowdfunding proposes that you don't do that, but that you popularize, that you do uh, scientific popularization, that you talk to other people, that you explain what you're doing in layman's terms to people who are not experts, and you think of having a community, a large community of people who think that you're a very, a very good idea for uh, for any investment and it works super well and as a lot of people say when they come to capital cell we're not sure we want to talk to a corporate there is someone who said might invest a million whatever hey, if you have a better option go ahead I'm just saying that there are not that many so um, hopefully you're getting the idea that well it's a bit weird you've never done it before but it works super well so let me skip ahead to this. This is super important. This is how you crowdfund. Actually, this is how you fundraise. The same applies to offline fundraising. What you really want to get in order to crowdfund is investor traction. I'm going to skip, although it is here. Uh, so we can, if you want, uh, a bit later, I can tell you about how we select projects at Capital Cell, but for the moment, um, let me tell you about how to uh, fundraise and how crowdfunding works. When do you have to come to talk to us? You have to come to a crowdfunding platform when you already have investors, actually, because you're bringing the investors. Um, this is sometimes a bit... Uh, uncomfortable for people who come to us to a crowdfunding platform thinking that the crowdfunding platform is a financial agent that's going to find investors for you. But that's not how it works. If you think that, it is the same as thinking that, you know, when you come of age, someone is going to find your romantic partner for you. It doesn't work like that because in order to fundraise your project on day one, the first deck that you do, the first plan that you have is terrible. It is always terrible. I know that in my last fundraise, the deck that finally worked was version 18.2. The only person who can create a product, a deck, a proposal, etc., that investors actually like is you. So once you have that, you can go to a crowdfunding platform. And the only way to know that you have a a product that investors want is to get a few investors. That's what we call traction. So your funding round is going to be complex. You're going to have a part with institutional or business angels, a part with crowdfunding, loans, grants, etc., etc. And I think that the first thing you have to do, obviously you, you're going to be applying for all the public money you can get. But the first thing you have to do for a small round, for example, is get a business angel for a larger round, a small fund, whatever. But you have to get first a lead investor. A lead investor is going to let you get more private investors and private investments is going to leverage debt, whether it's um, EIT, whether it's an ESA in Spain, whether it's BPI in France, or whether it's even a bank debt. Um, so you need a lead investor. That's the first thing you have to do. What do I need before I go to a crowdfunding platform? You need a lead investor. 
Um, who's a lead investor? Is an investor with great knowledge or credibility that can be a business angel, it can be a KOL, it can be a VC, it can be a corporate, whatever. It has to be someone who generates trust with other investors. And this is really one of the keys. The lead investor sets the valuation for the round. What you're doing here, a little bit like an IPO, when you put a company on the stock exchange, you have to set a price for the share. Who sets it? I can already tell you, not you. Valuations, the valuation that you want, you know, that uh, 12 million valuation for an in vitro uh, stage company, that doesn't work. The valuation that works is the valuation that an investor with knowledge or credibility is going to agree with you. And that means that valuation that you agree with uh, an investor, then that you can publish. So all the people are going to accept it. Um, so um, getting a lead investor, because as I said, you may have detected a bit of a, a, an illogic loop in what I'm saying. We're an alternative to VCs, but 40% of our rounds have a VC as a lead investor. So before you crowdfund, fund, you need to find a VC. Well, yes, um, it is. Yeah, I know it's a bit weird, but um, first, um, Crowdfunding is not an alternative to VC. In our experience, it's a perfect complement to VCs. So a lot of VCs bring us rounds where they already have like a syndicate of VCs putting in 5 million, but they need an extra 1.5. Or VCs that are putting in half a million, one of the, the few VCs that do small tickets, they put in half a million, but they need another 750. So we have a lot of that. But a lead investor doesn't necessarily have to be a VC, as I said, on Capital Cell. Or it can be a business angel, it can be uh, a syndicate of dentists, it can be uh, whatever. But it's difficult to find. And actually, um, it's the, in all of our process of selection, that's where most companies die. They don't get a lead investor. So we don't have a lead investor, but let's crowdfund anyway. Well, no, don't do it. It is a really bad idea. It is a little bit like, you know, um, doing a wedding without having the groom yet. No, you really need to have it. First, it, it is absolutely illogical that you have a great technological breakthrough and you have zero investors. That doesn't even make sense. How is it possible? So the first investor in the next big thing in transplant or whatever, is going to be some bloke on the internet putting in a thousand, that doesn't make sense. So if your project has zero investors, you're not generating trust. And I could tell you a lot of stories about companies that we've trusted saying, it looks so good, it has to be good. And then, well, there was something that wasn't right. So you need a lead investor because no one is going to invest in a company with zero investors. Second, you're in love with your project and you might think that it's better than it actually is. Or even more typically, you're getting really good feedback from people. So there's a lot of people coming to us and saying, yeah, the project Inverready or Sophie Nova, they love it. Well, yeah, they love it, but you want money. Only when people actually give you money, you know that your project is investable. So don't go to your crowdfunding platform thinking, well, no one has ever given me money, but I'm sure that then they will give me money. Well, no, it is a little bit, you, you have to think of a crowdfunding campaign a little bit also like selling a new product. You know that when they sell a new product, and I don't know, when the Coca-Cola company is creating a new flavor of, uh, of cola or whatever, they don't just build it and put it on the supermarket to see what happens. They do a lot of focus groups. They do, you know, private sales. They give away samples. Uh, they do a lot of things to make sure that people actually like the product. And you have to do the same. You have to get letters of intent or get actual money from people before you know that your product can go on the crowdfunding platform. And that, by the way, that is the process between version 1.0 of your deck and version 18.2, which is the one that works. Um, finally, you need critical mass. More on that now. You need critical mass be 
because once you start crowdfunding, um, you will see that about one in a thousand people who look at your project is going to invest. So, you know, you need a lot of people to look at it. And you need also uh, people who are going to do relatively large investments. So there is uh, a three phase theory uh, around fundraising and that applies to offline fundraising as well. If you remember the rockets that go to the moon back in the 60s when it was, uh, when it was in fashion, they were a three stage rockets like the one in the picture here. And the part here, the rocket that first went to the moon, Saturn V, the most powerful engine made by man ever, was only meant to do the first 100 kilometers of a journey of you know 700,000 kilometers back and forth. That is your lead investor. It's incredibly complicated to get it, and it only gets you, you know, through the door, but it is absolutely essential. And then you have a second thing that is essential, the core. So the booster rocket that's going to make you cover a large part of the round. These are the core followers. Why core followers? Because once you have a lead investor, um, I have also to warn you, because a lot of people ask us, I have already found one corporate or family office that covers 30% of the round. Now I want to put the thing on crowdfunding and you get the rest of the money. Well, no, that's not quite how it works. You still need to make sure that more people want to invest in it. So I'm going to tell you a story about ourselves and then I'm going to move over to the questions, just to give you an example of what I mean by that. Most people don't take decisions, but it doesn't mean that they're not going to invest. So. Uh, back in 2017, we went to the UK and we decided to have you know, open our company and our operations there. Uh, for that, we wanted to have local uh, um, investors. We didn't want Spanish money, we, want, we wanted British money to open the company there. So we spoke to a few people. What you see here are real names and the actual amounts that were proposed uh, to invest. So we spoke to a lot of people and they all liked our project. So when we went to speak to Sunil, we told him that David really liked the project. And when we talked to David, we told him that Pierre really liked our project. So at some point we said, people really like our project. Let's ask them for money. And in the next slide, you'll see how many, the colored ones were the people who actually gave us money. So no one. No. They liked the project but no one invested money. So what did we do? We decided to concentrate on a few of them. So we decided to concentrate on Pierre, that actually was a VC, Amadeus, on Alistair, can't remember the surname, largest fintech investor in the UK, on Will, who was a very successful entrepreneur with a few exits in biotech and very respected, and Ian Tomlinson, former vice president of uh, GSK at GlaxoSmithKline. So we sit down with them, and we negotiated with them in a different way. We approached them saying, we want you to be our main shareholder and our main investor. What do you want? So after a lot of work and a lot of talk, uh, the VC did what VCs do very well, which is continue to say that they really liked us. And that was said yes or no. Alistair said uh, to not email him again, please. Will said, you're going to burn all your money and you're going to crash. You're going to close your operations in two years maximum. Uh, by the way, it turns out he was right. <laughs> he was right. Uh, and then we spoke to a few others in the meantime. Dominique said that he could only invest 10. Sunil and Prashan, who are brothers, said uh, a very curt no. But finally, we managed to get Ian Tomlinson on board. So we changed the business plan the way he liked it. We changed a lot of things. Uh, he wanted to be chairman of the board. He asked us how he wanted the salaries to work, et cetera, et cetera. And then we agreed with him. So he came on board, he invested 150K and he was chairman of the board. So then we sent an email to everyone saying, hey, we now have a lead investor. It's Ian Tomlinson, former vice president of Glaxo, blah, blah, blah. Uh, he's going to be chairman of the board. Do you want to invest? And within 72 hours, we had all these guys saying yes. Uh, now, these people wanted to invest, but what we got from them previously 
had been an assortment of uh, quest of uh, responses like, I'm in the middle of other investments. Um, I don't think it's going to work. Uh, yes, I really love it. Uh, if someone else invests, I will, et cetera, et cetera. So all these people invested within 72 hours of us having a lead. Obviously, that happened because we had already talked to them. Um, then, with all this money, we already had covered the round. That was all the money we needed. So we sent an email to everyone saying, thanks a lot, we are covered the round. Please allow us to send you an email every now and then to tell you how we're doing. And then with that, Sunil and Prashant send us an email equally short saying, we'll put in 50. And Dominic said, yeah, all right, I can do a little bit more. So we now had more money than we wanted or that, than we expected. And with that, we went to crowdfund and we crowdfunded uh, 300K in only five days. That was really quick. And we did it on our platform, which means that we didn't go to another platform with a huge database of people. We did it in a database that is ours. So by definition, zero external investors which I think is the way that crowdfunding should be done. You don't have to even think of someone else bringing you investors. You have to think of getting a good lead investor that's going to make you look really good in front of large-ish investors that are going to do tickets as large as possible. And with all of that, you already have, as you see here, at least nine very rich people who are going to talk well about you to their friends and you have a lot of the round covered before you go so that is how you should crowdfund and then i'm not even go uh, i'm not even going to go into what you have to do once you crowdfund uh, just a brief note you need to make sure that you have a very very clear investment story because you have to repeat it in mails and in conversations at least 20 times a day and crowdfunding is going to amplify whatever you do in fundraising. It's not going to, if you do nothing, crowdfunding is going to multiply your zero efforts by a lot. That still makes zero. Um, a crowdfunding campaign is a lot of effort. And one of, the, um, one of the entrepreneurs that we had on the platform in the past described it very aptly as something akin to a political campaign. So it means, there's a preparation where you make sure that you have people who support you, who likes it, who are going to vote for you. And then for a short period of time, you know, in the case of a political campaign, it's 15 days, maximum effort, as Deadpool would say, you know, a lot of communication, mails, nonstop, et cetera, et cetera. That's how it works. And the effort is yours. So keep your eyes on the prize, which is a lot of money. Um, Keep the independence of your company, get a good valuation, and get the money you need fast. That's it. I'm not going to, because I think there were a few questions. Yes. Um, so. Thanks so much. Let's take, let's take some questions. Um, the last one, based on your experience, what is an average lead time to set up the crowdfunding and the time to execute? I think you mentioned that. Assuming a lead investor exists, can a crowdfund be considered a co-lead investors in the mind of the EIB? Well, that's maybe unrelated, but you talk about the, the time scale, right? You said three, four months is possible. Um, the most difficult thing is to get the investor traction. If you're, and we've had entrepreneurs who've been careful to do that. They've, uh, you know, already been for, for a long time doing communication, going to events, knowing people, networking, etc. Um, and they already have a lead investor. With those at Capital Cell, we've, we've set up campaigns in less than three weeks that then have gone on for, well, we've had a lot of campaigns lasting less than 24 hours. So it can be extremely fast if you have the investor traction. If you've never spoken to anyone about your project before, that that takes a lot longer. But normally, if you have a lead investor, it should take a couple of months. About the EAB, we will check internally. I think because of the amounts, you might need to have other investors um, to 
raise a typical amount in a co-investment. Uh, but uh, we will check with EIB and then... For that, I have to say the capital cell is an accepted co-investor for a lot of people. So we've done co-investments with, uh, uh, with EIC for a few companies, uh, for Enisa in Spain, uh, BPI France we haven't done yet, but they've said okay, with a couple of regional funds, NACO in Nouvelle Aquitaine in France. Uh, so generally it is an accepted co-investor for a lot of uh, public um, grants and funds. Okay, great, thanks. There's a question about um, convertible notes or safes. I understand we're talking mostly about equity investment, no, Daniel? This, this, these are not loans, either convertible or safes? No, there are platforms who do loans, not capital sale, we only do equity raises. And uh, the, um, the platforms who do loans the problem is that basically they, they follow banking rules. So if your company is eligible for a bank loan, then you can do a crowdfunded loan. It's pretty much the same as a bank. We can do convertibles, uh, although not literally convertibles. We have to do an equity in, an invent, but it works like a convertible. What we can't do and no one can do is saves because from an accounting point of view, that is an American thing. It doesn't really translates here convertibles yeah saves no maybe you can give us a bit of a summary because maybe some scientists in the audience might not be familiar with the convertible sorry. versus saves sorry um an equity raise it means that people are going to we can do um, um a, an, a, an equity raise meaning that you're going to issue new shares in the company and people are going to get them on a crowdfunding platform, you cannot sell or buy existing shares. You have to issue new shares and people can uh, get them. A convertible loan means that people uh, loan you the money so they don't get shares for it. But normally you can't give the money back within, with an interest as in a loan. You will give the interest back and the money back in the form of shares. So instead of getting the shares now, you're getting them in the future. This is typically done because if you need a bit of money now, but you know that you have a very complicated negotiation with a VC in the future, typically a convertible loan lets you say, all right, let's not set a valuation now because that might damage your conversations with the VC. You loan the money. I will agree the conditions with the VC who are the boss here, and you will get the same valuation minus a discount, typically 10, 15, 20%, because you've invested earlier. So that's what a convertible loan lets you do. And that we can do. A safe is an American invention that it, I find really funny. You sign a paper saying, we will convert your money into shares at some point, at some conditions, we'll see. That's basically what it says. So it's not very well accepted here in Europe. Very good. Thanks. There is a question on how the evaluation is estimated. Which model of, or formula is used to determine the valuation? We don't. Um, at, at a crowdfunding platform, typically you're not going to negotiate the valuation. We've tried. Um, but when we tell people, look, you can't do a 10 minute valuation, it should be four, they just don't listen to us. That's why at Capital Cell we have a model where the lead investor is mandatory. Someone else has to set the valuation. And the only, um, the only people that is going to set the valuation and an entrepreneur is going to listen to them is whoever is going to do an investment. So a VC, for example, tells you, look, I'll give you half a million, but the valuation has to be four. Then you take it or leave it. With us, it's impossible. We tell them you should do four. 10 is not going to work. But we're not signing a check, so people don't listen to us. Typically, if you go to a crowdfunding platform, you have to be very careful with that. If you go to a crowdfunding platform without a lead investor and you set your own valuation, you're wrong. You know, 99% of the time is you're setting the wrong valuation. The only right valuation in, an, in a startup investment is whatever is agreed between an investor who knows what he's doing and the entrepreneur. And that's why we ask Capital Cell. We give advice but we take the valuation 